Although I had not intended to preach a mini-series, the Spirit of God said otherwise. And so we will continue in the 19th chapter of 1 Kings this morning, and I'll be reading verses 7 through 16. So listen here and receive God's word. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched Elijah and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Elijah got up and ate and drank, and then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah answered, I have been ver very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram, and you shall also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shephat, of abel Meholia, as prophet in your place. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Last week we learned that Elijah had reached his breaking point. He was ready to give up and throw in his mantle. And he asked God to take his life, to allow him to just die. At this point, God dispatched messengers to provide food and water for the prophet Elijah as he lay under the broom tree, feeling defeated, discouraged, and possibly depressed. After taking another nap, a second messenger of God provided another meal that would sustain Elijah for 40 days and 40 nights as he made his way to Mount Horeb, the very mountain where Moses communed with God and received the Ten Commandments and witnessed the glory of God in its fullness. Although Elijah was burned out, to use our modern vernacular, God had other plans. God sent him to have a mountaintop experience. Arriving at Mount Horeb, Elijah spends the night in a cave, and this time the Lord does not send a messenger. The Lord asks Elijah in the morning, what are you doing here, Elijah? God knows precisely what Elijah is doing there. Elijah followed the directions of God and retreated to Mount Horeb as instructed, but he was still burned out. He was still fearful, discouraged, and depressed. Even though God had fed him and he was outside the reach of Jezebel who had threatened to kill him, and he had traveled 40 days and 40 nights and arrived safely on Mount Horeb, Elijah was no better than when he lay under that broom tree. Elijah answers God by explaining or more appropriately complaining, I have been very zealous for the Lord the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. 
Elijah obviously had forgotten when Jezebel was killing the prophets that Obadiah risked his life by courageously hiding 100 prophets of God. Elijah obviously ignored the multitude of the incredible conversion of people on Mount Carmel when God rained down fire from heaven and consumed the offering on the altar. One commentator shares, the burned out prophet can only see the darkest side of the situation as he voices his egocentric complaint to God. Beloved, too often we are so focused on the problems or our perception of what is wrong with a person or situation that we lose sight of the positive. We lose sight of or forget that God has provided ways out of no ways. We lose sight of or forget that in our darkest hours, God's light has shined brightly. We lose sight of or forget that God guided our footsteps when we did not know what direction to take. We lose sight of or forget that despite our tendency to expect God to move when we want, God moves in time and not on time. God does not acknowledge or engage Elijah in his complaint. God tells Elijah to come out of the cave and stand on the mountain, for God is about to pass by. I am reminded that when Moses lodged his complaint about the people he was leading through the wilderness to the promised land, that God instructed him to do the same thing, to stand on the mountain and to see God's glory pass by. Commentator Will Gaffney writes, God responds to Elijah's self-assessment with self-revelation. First, God displayed historic and traditional signs of God's presence, a windstorm, an earthquake, and a fire. But God was not present among the usual suspects. Then there was a sound or a voice, a fine silence. And that is where Elijah encountered God." End of quote. It is curious that the passage relays that God was not in the wind, which was so violent that it split mountains and broke rocks. God was not in the earthquake that shook the earth violently. God was not in the fire that scorched and burned. Typically these events, these accompany theophanies, the visible manifestation of God to humanity. One commentator writes, in the previous chapter, a rainstorm and fire were associated with the power of God. Yet in each case now, Elijah discovers that the Lord is not present in the familiar sight, signs. End of quote. Beloved God does not always present God's self in ways we expect or may have experienced before. God does not always come to us spectacularly. Sometimes God speaks in silence. That was Elijah's experience that day as he stood on the side of the mountain. And if I use my sanctified imagination, I believe the sound of sheer silence was the calm that Elijah experienced after the proverbial storm. Often silence washes over the earth after we have experienced devastation, loss, wonder, or the unknown. It has been my experience that in those moments, I know that God is present, leading, guiding, and walking with me. I am thankful that even when God is not speaking or appears to be silent, God is often speaking the loudest. I spent a week of my sabbatical in Charleston, South Carolina. I was drawn there by the Spirit of God to explore the history of the place where the most significant percentage of enslaved people were brought into this country. I had the desire to walk the shores where my ancestors arrived after being taken violently from their homeland, stripped of their freedom, culture, and personhood. I spent one day at a former plantation, and after the tour that was led by a descendant of the Gullah people, I sat down and I took my shoes off and I planted my feet in the soil. And I prayed. I prayed for all the people that had been slaved enslaved on that property. 
I prayed for their descendants. I prayed for myself. And in the silence, the wind began to blow. And then there was a loud crescendo of crickets chirping. And after that sound dissipated, a soft rain began to fall. And I found myself in total silence once more. I felt in the depths of my soul that the ancestors and God were speaking to my tired and exhausted self. And they said, do not grow weary in well-doing, for you will reap at harvest time if you do not give up. I felt the ancestors were telling me, Patrice, you can go on a little further because God is with you. In stillness, Elijah encountered the Lord, and only then did he come out of the cave and stand on the side of the mountain. He covered his face with his mantle. And God asked Elijah the same rhetorical question. What are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, how did you get here? What caused you to think that you are all alone on this journey when on Mount Carmel I showed myself to be the only God of Israel? I fed you when you were hungry and gave you water when you thirsted. I protected you when your life was in danger. I gave you authority to perform miracles and to speak prophecy. How did you get here, Elijah? And I asked the same rhetorical question of us today. How did we get here, ELPC? How did we get to the place where we are questioning God's timing when God is yet present with us? We are still welcoming infants and children into the body of Christ through the sacrament of baptism. We are still receiving new members. We are still ministering to the least, the lost, and the left behind. We are still being the people of God. It may seem that God is silent as we await what or who is next, but in reality, God is speaking every day sometimes in silence, that we are to stay the course. We should not lose heart or feel that we have been left alone to fend for ourselves, for God is here. Elijah responds to God in the same way that he did before. He has not been changed by his mountaintop experience. Elijah's experience of God in silence has not made a difference. He is still despondent, depressed, and discouraged. Gaffney comments, Elijah saw, heard, and experienced God in fantastic ways. The power of God flowed through him to work miracles that were unequaled by anyone before him. Yet Elijah was essentially unchanged by this incredible encounter with God. And Gaffney says that God fired him, or at least announced his retirement. It's hard to know how Elijah heard the command to anoint another prophet to take his place. End of quote. In my estimation, God did not unequivocally fire Elijah. God gave Elijah another assignment and sent him in another direction and commissioned him to set up the future. God instructed Elijah to go north into the wilderness in Damascus and there Elijah was to anoint Hazael as king of the Syrians, Jehu as king of Israel and Elisha as his successor. This is a lesson for us. God always has a succession plan. I have had the honor and privilege of serving faithfully alongside Pastor Heather as your acting co-pastor and head of staff for over two years. We have faithfully attempted to face challenges, 
and this unique time. And if I might say so, I think that we've done some excellent work. There have been times when I felt accepted and loved by you. And then there were times when I felt like I could not please anyone, much less God. I realized that even though there were times when God seemed silenced, that God was speaking volumes in the silence. I could hear God say to me and EOPC, I know the plans that I have for you plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Beloved of people, people of God, I ask you to consider what God may be saying to you today, individually and collectively. As I recall that as Jesus hung on the cross and cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was silent and did not audibly respond to the beloved son. And yet Jesus knew that God was with him. Sometimes we are speaking so loudly, demanding answers or clarity. Sometimes we are searching for or expecting God to show up spectacularly. And sometimes we get in our own way, being egocentric and thinking the world revolves around our wants, our needs, our desires, our timing, rather than around the will of God. God is waiting for us to be quiet, to listen with our spiritual ears and open our hearts to just be still and know. And when we do, perhaps God will speak into the silence. May it be so. Amen. <laughs>